Welcome to the Times of Israel's What Matters Now. I'm Amanda Borchel Dan here with our senior analyst, Chaviv Retegur, in my home for an informal conversation about what is going on with our government. Chaviv. Hi, Amanda. I was actually away several days this week, and so I'd like to take a bit of a step back and have you explain to me what happened while I was gone. It seems like one of the most explosive weeks that we've had in a long time in terms of the Knesset. And so we had, of course, the ruling from the High Court of Justice saying that the draft has to begin for Haredi, for ultra-Orthodox starting July 1st in batches of at least beginning with 3,000. But also there is a lot of stuff going on inside the halls of the Knesset, including yesterday, it kind of seemed to me yet another sign of some uh, revolt within Likud. So Chaviv, can you just explain to me what happened this week? Well, you know, about the... um Knesset agenda this week, it's hard to know where to start. There, there are dozens of small things that kind of all point in the same direction, but we'll try and talk about a few of the bigger ones. One, Benny Gantz left 19 days ago. He left the coalition. And since then, Netanyahu has had his ideal coalition, far-right parties, uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties, Likud, and has been unable to do anything, to pass anything, to seriously advance anything. Shas had an initiative in which it uh, wanted to receive permission from the Knesset, a change in the law, to appoint a thousand municipal rabbis. There was a rebellion from Likud mayors, Mayor Bibas of Modi'in, um, mayors of, I believe, Nitivot, Sderot, came to the Knesset and in front of the cameras yelled at the Knesset Likud MKs. Um, and that entire initiative was torpedoed. And Shas was very angry at Netanyahu and at Likud. Um, the, there is a bill advancing to expand the amount of reserve duty that an individual Israeli can be called to do. People have done 200 days of reserves this year, and this will allow more time and also longer. Um, I was, uh, I'm 43. I was kicked out of reserves uh, three, four years ago. Uh, I aged out of it. My uh, battalion got a new cohorts of young people, so the old people were kicked out, some of them even before they aged out. Um, if the bill is, I understand it, the version that passed in the first reading, uh, which means it's not yet the law, but it needs two more votes in the, in the plenum to become law advances, then I will return to reserve duty because it would push my age up to 45, my final age for service. Um, the Supreme Court decision was, you know, we've, We've, the country has torn itself apart over this question of is the Supreme Court too powerful or not. I tend to uh, say it is very powerful, unhealthily powerful, but that, you know, but I was very critical of the government's attempt to reform it last year. But nevertheless, the decision that said that you, the government must begin now immediately drafting the ultra Orthodox is experienced by the political system as an, an incredibly. I don't know what to call it, politically violent intrusion into their domain, it will has potentially unraveled the coalition. Netanyahu was very upset at this decision. The ultra-Orthodox talked about the tyranny of the court. But it was actually a very conservative decision. The decision was very simple. The law says you have to draft them, you have to draft them. You can't delay forever and ever and ever, to the point that the justices even criticized the attorney general, who's usually on their side of things, and said she gave all kinds of delays and had time for negotiation and developing new bills to replace the bill that uh, expired um, last year, I think it was. Um, And so the government is now trying to advance a draft bill to exempt a huge portion of the population from service while advancing a bill to pile on a lot more service to those who do serve and have served and have sacrificed tremendously. And one of the fascinating points to keep in mind is Likud voters have seen some of the longest periods of service and sacrificed some of the most in this war, in this year. And so there's a rebellion that we're seeing for the first time in a very long time from within Likud, people like Defense Minister Gallant and Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee Chairman Yuli Edelstein and Economy Minister Nir Barkat, and a whole list of MKs, um, from Dan Ilus, who you and I know, uh, to uh, um, 
אלי דלל, to אלי רביבו, to טלי גוטליב, to משה סעדה. These are names of Likud MKs, unlike the three first ones I mentioned, Galen, Edelstein, and Barkat, who are either multi-millionaires, have their own base of support in the party, and have previous careers that were extremely successful and are well-known in their own right. The names I just gave now are people who are fairly unknown and who Netanyahu could wipe out with a, with a wave of his hand in the next primary. And they are joining Netanyahu. In various ways and various bills the rebellion and so it's been a it's been a roller coaster ride of a week uh, not just for Israelis but for the government for sure and this rebellion that you're describing of course we're also seeing it among real people not just members of Knesset and I'm hearing from you know just friends and acquaintances so many people who have been lifelong Likud voters maybe here and there straying out to for example Gidon Saar's party when they thought that there was an alternative or viable alternative to Likud but so many people who are just at a loss for what to do because while their hearts are with Likud and, and some of these people are even the children of the founders of the party they, I mean lifelong Likud voters, they just can't anymore. They just can't. Because as you were describing, there's this paralysis and there's this feeling that, of course, Likud is not working for the people anymore, rather for the politicians. So it's really fascinating, actually, in these past uh, two, three weeks, even, I would say, hearing the murmurings from inside Likud, because this has been a party that has been in lockstep through Likud. Through the judicial reform for example when you heard here and there rumors murmurings but you really didn't see anything playing out so this paralysis that we're seeing in the past couple of weeks is is really far-reaching and maybe it hasn't reached the headlines of the Times of Israel always including a standards reform that we've talked about in the past uh, several years but and also you know legislation being pushed forward so what's some of the symptoms that you're seeing of this paralysis I think that maybe the best one um, and certainly one I I know well for the um, obvious reasons funny reasons reasons that are important to disclose um, there is a, a major major import reform um, in front of the government um, in which the standards of, of uh, required of, of consumer products um, the standards they have to meet for import are being changed to match the European standards the reform is called what is good for Europe is good for Israel and it covers um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of products from um, floor tiles to elevators to bicycles to tampons to uh, speed stick deodorant just just hundreds of things and Israel and the disclosure is that the major force in this country's politics leading this reform for the last three four years is my wife Rachel who is a uh, former legislative director for the coalition and now works in this extraordinary organization called lobby 99 which is a public crowdsourced lobbying firm where you buy a subscription to And the lobby and then you get a vote in what the lobby represents you in the Knesset and 12,000 Israelis are subscribed anyway this is a reform that every democracy should have and would change the world but I am a completely unbiased objective journalist from Mars uh, saying that obviously and uh, the point of the of bringing up the standards reform is that a huge part of it just failed this week in the Knesset and what's interesting is there um, the economy ministry is run by Likud the health ministry is run by Shas the government has been pushing forward the A reform to synchronize the Israeli standards with the European standards Europe is our major trading partner and if you synchronize with the Europeans you've synchronized with everybody else in the world and when the reform actually hit the Knesset this week it turned out that it had 20 standards moving forward instead of 530 out of the economy ministry the health ministry standards that have been reformed hundreds of standards from the health ministry are The, almost the entire package of standards is moving forward to reform. The ministry is lifting uh, the requirement to have import licenses. So anybody can import from anywhere these products. Um, and it's, de- it's, it's slated to pass by the end of this Knesset session at the end of July. It'll be enforced in September. It's extremely reasonable to assume that by November, December, is re- the, the cost of toothpaste in Israel will go down dramatically. The health ministry is Shas. Shas is able to move forward. dramatic cost of living reforms that are just such low-hanging fruit it's just a slight regulatory change and we match the rest of the world and allow free trade and the Likud-led economy ministry where hundreds of these standards are stuck 
can't move forward. Literally, when they presented it to the Knesset, there was nothing there. People, this sounds like, you know, some kind of tiny little minutia diving into the weeds of the most minute Israeli economic policy. This led this week, while you were gone overseas, enjoying yourself, this led the news broadcasts. One day this week, it was the headline news at the top of the news on all the major television networks, except, of course, Channel 14, which won't say anything bad about Likud, but it led everybody else's news broadcast. And it was, it just, the astonishing thing is how, how much this is low-hanging fruit, how much, as long as you are not Likud, you can accomplish things, witness Shas, and how much Likud has become incapable of moving forward on any front, on any issue. And that feeling of helplessness under its current leadership and the way the party has really become what it's become, gutted institutions. There's barely a primary in the party. The institutions of the party used to be... Inc- Remember when we used to talk about the Likud Central Committee? Remember when we used to talk about the Likud uh, Secretariat, which ran the election, and so to become the chairman of the Secretariat in internal elections means you got to guide election policy alongside the party leader? None of that exists anymore. The institutions technically exist, but there's nothing there. There's no discourse. There's no discussion. Primaries are, aren't, aren't the festive affairs they once were. Likud primaries were the top story of the day because they were so fun and festive and important to the future of Israeli politics. No longer. So, so it sounds you know. like what you're saying, Khabib, is that Likud may be the largest party in the Knesset right now, but it's not protecting or working for its electorate anymore because it basically kowtows to keeping the coalition alive, keeping Netanyahu in power. And at the same time, a smaller party such as Shas, which, I mean, really has some great politicians right now who are working for the people. You mentioned the health minister, also the minister of the interior has gotten a lot of acclaim for his uh, prowess in working in a job that he didn't actually even want. If I'm not mistaken, he's a PhD candidate and he just wanted to continue studying and doing his PhD, but instead he's actually working for the people. But what we're seeing essentially is that Likud, though it is the reigning power, is not working to help its people. It's paralyzed. And so that's why we're seeing its voters serving 200 plus, plus, plus days in the reserves while other voters are not at all. Yeah, we are. The point of bringing up standards is that on the big, big things, the dramatic things, uh, look, uh, this government's inability to solve the Haredi draft question I would hold it against it in the sense that it's that's their one job. That's their responsibility to to tackle. The Knesset's job is to tackle these tough, painful contradictions of Israeli society. But it is one of the big ones. And no previous government has solved it. So it's not like, right? So uh, the failure to solve the big stuff means that we need someone who can solve the big stuff. I, great. I respect, you know, it's, it's, it's an argument against the government, but it's not such a powerful argument against the government because it is actually that difficult. But the simple, easy stuff... The really easy, important stuff that Likud's own voters desperately need and want. That we've seen a party so gutted of institutions, of strength, of capacity. And then you suddenly step back and you realize Israeli politics are littered with refugees from Likud who needed to get out from under this sort of monarchical rule that has taken hold within the party. And that includes Lieberman, and that includes Bennett, and that includes... um, um, Gidon Saar. Gidon Saar and, and Zev Elkin and just, just probably 15 seats in the, I think 20 seats in the polls and, and 12 seats in the Knesset, in the current Knesset. So, um, yes, we are looking at a government that is losing the thread of its own story at a level much, much deeper than deep public dissatisfaction with how the war is being handled, which is deep and real and important and morale is collapsing because of it in every poll where we measure this but it's incapable of doing even the easy stuff. So you mentioned polls and one headline that did uh, hit my (laughs) consciousness while I was away for a few days is this uh, potential team up of a bunch of guys 
Bennett, at least Lieberman, uh, Giron Sar, and uh, Yossi Cohen, who is not currently a politician, but the, in this uh, dream, uh, kind of like those uh, dream teams that people play, the fake teams that that people play. Anyway, that shows him. fantasy sports? Yes, fantasy sports, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so in the fantasy political party of this team up, they would basically take the election that, of course, we need to remind people, there is no election on the horizon. There is uh, until at least, what, 2026, a stable government? Uh, March 31st, 2025, they have to pass a budget or the Knesset dissolves. If they can pass that budget, I think it's the middle of 2026. Right. So in our fantasy political scheme, these people would take it. But your thesis seems to be is that because they are former Likudnikim who are staying true to the, shall we say, party line. Is that what you're saying? You know, it's every time people smell an election, they start playing fantasy politics, exactly like you're saying. And I understand the impulse and I think it's interesting. And a lot of times um, political leaders um, kind of fall for the, the, you know, these have become self-fulfilling prophecies. So many people so hunger for and, uh, you know, they're they're so sort of mainline Likud and don't like the Likud party as it is constituted today. Usually that's a statement about Netanyahu that they then look for this answer. The answer then appears because where there's a market, there's somebody selling the thing. Um, And then this party gets, you know, sometimes 30 seats and sometimes four seats. Um, So there's sometimes this sort of centrist version of Likud that that comes out of these fantasies. I'm not saying that's not going to happen. It quite easily could happen. These people are probably part, the, the, the people you named are probably part of the leaks that are driving the speculation because they want the speculation so they can come in and respond to it. But the interesting thing right now is the rebellion from within because that's new and it's powerful and it's sustained. Here's, a, here's how we know it's sustained. Gallant, Barkat, and Edelstein, the three people who have said over the last week, we will not vote for a draft law to solve this terrible thing cutting through the coalition, which the court now says we have to start literally drafting young Haredi men. The court just ruled that the army has to start drafting Haredi, that probably just Haredi men, there are religious exemptions for women that are very easy to apply for, and many religious Zionist women who believe in army service nevertheless apply for them because religiously they can't serve in combat units or military units. So, it, it, we're talking about the drafting of thousands of young Haredi men for in every cohort. And that cuts right through the coalition. The Likud base wants it. The Haredi parties can't live with it. And that threatens to split the coalition. And so Netanyahu is looking for legislation, desperately looking for, like, he probably thinks it's impossible. So I don't know if he's literally like trying to working on text, but but he, he needs desperately a bill that satisfies all things. It satisfies the court just because the government stops violating the law by not drafting them. It satisfies the Shas by not drafting and UTJ by not drafting too many or people who don't want to. And it satisfies the Likud base by drafting some. So he needs to find that. Now, that is a Venn diagram with no overlaps. And nevertheless, so far that anyone has found in 30, 40 years of debating this issue. Um but what's fascinating is that as he begins scrambling to find this solution that holds his coalition together, Edelstein, Barkat, and Gallant have all three come out and said, I'm not voting for a draft bill that doesn't have consensus, by which they mean opposition support from Gantz or somebody, Lapid, somebody over on the other side of the aisle. This coalition alone, Edelstein has publicly said this week. Right, broad consensus, he Broad said. consensus, but he, he also said those who don't serve can't be the ones who decide how much those who do serve are going to have to serve. That's about the Miluim bill, but the reserve bill, but it's also about the draft bill. So Haredim are considered by that Likud faction not the voice that gets to decide whether Haredim serve or whether everybody serves or how we serve because they don't serve, right? So that statement reminds me, I can't help but remember that Barkad on judicial reform said, my high-tech friends are warning me this is disastrous. And 
Edelstein on judicial reform back in the day said, we're tearing the country apart. And then Gallant actually threw himself over the tracks to stop it. And Bibi fired him and the country went into open rebellion. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets. The Manufacturers Association and the labor unions all went on strike at the same time. The airport closed and Bibi stopped the reform back in March of 2023. These three are now not letting Bibi off the hook of a draft law that's serious consensus draft law. I'd like to point out that what you said is obviously accurate, that two of the people said things and one of the people did something. And that seems to be the case again, because we have Barkat and Edelstein saying, and then we have Gallant not voting for something that Likud brought, the the previous uh, rendition of the draft bill. Right. The first draft bill, it's a 64-seat coalition. It had 63 votes. Gallant was the only one to vote against. Shas asked him to just abstain, just leave the room, and he refused. He voted against. He will only support publicly, openly, explicitly. Long story short, but I think he dragged Barkat and Edelstein with him at this point. I think they're there as well. Long story short, one more vote. One more. Yoav Kish, fighter pilot, secular Likudnik, a member of Knesset who grew, who rose up the party ranks in a faction inside Likud called Haliberalim, which means the liberals. Um, Yoav Kish is being talked about as another member informally. He hasn't yet opened his mouth, which, you know, so maybe this is a, a fantasy of the people who hope there's four. But one more, and Bibi doesn't have the votes to pass any bill of any kind. And so... There is a the rebellion is deep. It's real. It's sustained. It's it's a holdover from judicial reform, and that itself I think is really fascinating. One of the interesting points here is the country is divided I, politically, as far as we can tell from polls. As far as I can, my interpretation of the polls. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to put this in the mouth of any other pundit of any kind, but is that the country is essentially divided into three groups, and it the three groups are divided on the nature of Netanyahu. of the country roughly thinks he's not going to win this war because he doesn't want to. He wants to maintain the war. He wants the war to go on forever and ever because the day the war ends, he has to face the political music. And that's a horrifying thing to say. It's it's an accusation of monstrous immorality. And because it means that, you know, Israelis are rotting in dungeons in Gaza and, and soldiers are dying and sacrificing because Netanyahu is only thinking of his political schedule. Um, this is a, a response also to the sense that the war in Gaza really is dragging out. The army froze for a few months in Gaza, didn't move forward in February, March, April. Netanyahu doesn't want to win the war. The other, another 30%, roughly, some polls put it 10 points lower, some points put it five points higher, but roughly 25, 30% from the right criticize Netanyahu and say he is just very weak. He always takes the path of least resistance. This is what Smotrich says quietly about Netanyahu. Um, and he won't win the war because Biden, why did he stop the army in, for three months? Because Biden pressured him and he caves to all pressure. And therefore, when did, why did Israel go into Rafah in May? Because Smotrich and Benvir said, we're leaving the coalition. And suddenly the army found itself in Rafah, right? So um, he can't win. Personality is incapable of winning. So 40%, he doesn't want to. 30%, he does want to. He wants that legacy, but he can't. And then 30% support Netanyahu. And then when you talk to those 30%, you say, you support Netanyahu, but so many people, including such a huge swath of the right, think he can't win. Most Israelis today say, we can't win this war. And so you ask why do you support him? And they say, Gantz is worse. Bibi has a lot of problems. Everybody's got complaints about him. But Gantz is dangerous. Lapid is dangerous. They won't try and struggle and not necessarily succeed to win the war. They will actually walk away from the war, you know, as a principle and not, they don't want to win. And with Hezbollah, they'll just cave and lose and Israel will be destroyed. Netanyahu, we can trust to at least hold the line on some things and everybody else is more dangerous. And I want to, I want to bring that argument of his supporters here because I think that's an important critique. In other words, having the alternative is a big part of of shifting political loyalties. What we're seeing now with Likud is the problem with the monarchic style of Israeli politics that Netanyahu introduced. All policy that Netanyahu cares about has has moved into the prime minister's office, gutting entire institutions in the Israeli state. I ask ordinary Israelis, who's the foreign minister? Most people aren't sure. Now, 
back when you know Moshe Sharet was foreign minister or Abba Eben was foreign minister, there was, that wasn't a problem. Back when Tzipi Livni was foreign minister in the Olmert government, everybody knew she was foreign minister. Who's foreign minister today, Amanda? Yisrael Katz. But you're Amanda. That's why you know that. <laughs> Most Israelis, when's the last time anybody's ever heard from Yisrael Katz? The foreign ministry doesn't run major policy, diplomatic policy, foreign policy. It's all run in the National Security Council, the Mossad, which are directly under Netanyahu, and Minister Ron Dermer, who Netanyahu trusts and is an extremely competent man, but nevertheless, he is at Netanyahu's side as Minister of Strategic Cooperation, I think, I don't remember, some title, just to allow him to sit at the cabinet table. And that is true of many, many different institutions in the state. People say that Gantz is weak as a leader. He won't have that decisiveness. I happen to think that a lot of Netanyahu's decisiveness is rhetorical. It's not real because he so many things aren't getting done. If you put Netanyahu on mute, the record is a lot less impressive. But let's imagine he is that decisive monarchic central figure. The Israel that we live in and enjoy today wasn't built by the great centralizers of power. It was built by teams of rivals. It was built by when Olmert was prime minister or Sharon or Shamir or, or Barak or, or Rabin, every minister in their government controlled a real fiefdom. They had re- genuine power and genuine responsibility. Outside of Likud, we still have this in government. Ali El Busso, minister of health, wanted to do the job. So he brought in as his director general of the health ministry in this government, Balsi. Moshe Belsimantov, who is one of the most competent and well-liked and publicly trusted directors general of the health ministry in the history of the health ministry and came out of the treasury department and, and, and is just a deeply respected, serious, aggressive, by the way, in government. He gets what he wants or people pay a price uh, kind of a guy. And so if the health ministry is pushing a reform of standards, it'll get done. Balsi, by the way, became very famous, of course, in COVID, where he was the practical, Bibi did the policy thinking, talking a lot with Pfizer, Balsi deployed the actual COVID response and spoke to the country and was trusted by the country. And so Busa brought Balsi in to run the place, to run health in this country. Likud doesn't run its own ministries because everything is so centralized. And so my answer to Gantz is weaker It's a little bit like after John Paul II, Pope John Paul II was such a powerful, dominant figure in the church that when he was, when he died, the cardinals just intentionally chose a quiet, mild-mannered professor of theology. The the system needed to recover to stabilize. I think that a Gantz or a Galant, who is, by the way, the most trusted politician in polls of political trust that we have, Bibi is the least trusted. The most trusted is from the same political party, is Likud. Don't you think, though, that part of that is because he is the top of the most trusted institution in Israeli society, the army? It's the most trusted institution still. It could have gone another way. He was the defense minister on October 7. October 7 is as much his as Bibi's. And he said that in the first week. He got up on national television and he said... This is me. I'm responsible. I'm going to fix this. And that you should know I am aware. Those words have never left Netanyahu's lips. And that's a, not a small part of the gap. But my point is the trust isn't partisan. The trust is personal. And the distrust is personal. Because the most trusted is a Likud guy and the least trusted is a Likud guy. And so I think that if there is a Gallant or Gans or Lapid or Bennett or he is trying to make a comeback, which I think is impossible because the people who like him don't agree with him and the people who agree with him don't like him. But nevertheless, Khabib, I think Bennett is actually the most natural leader of this team of rivals. If you look at his government, it was exactly that. Every minister was from a different party almost, and he led them all pretty effortlessly. I take that. I uh, I just dissed him in passing. Uh, I do think he has a real political problem. But when he led with uh, Lapid, that government, the way they led the government, unity governments like that are rare. Um, having a six-party, a six-person party in the prime minister's chair is very rare for Israel. It's unique to Israel, but not unique to parliamentary democracies. It happened in Latvia and in Belgium right now. Right now, small parties are the prime minister. 
because big parties are at are at a at a loggerheads and one of them teams up with a small one gives them the prime minister's chair exactly the reason bennett became prime minister in other words um but um they led in exactly that kind of each minister is their own fiefdom kind of way that is the classic israeli government so i i take your point i, I don't know that bennett would be a bad prime minister uh his path um politically is is a difficult one though anybody else who replaces bb will be less centralizing than bb and ministries like the economy ministry will become real significant power centers again and effective again because ministers will own their policies so team of rivals is what replaces bb if this country is a lucky country and and that could i think be a good thing and that's my answer to them i think that is the single most political thing i've ever said and i apologize to bb supporters but most of the country now thinks that as long as he's in power we will lose the war and so it's time to have that conversation khaviv thank you as usual for bringing your insights and updates thanks amanda thanks for listening to this week's what matters now please check out another installment next week if you have any comments or questions about this or any other episode please drop us an email to podcast at timesofisrael.com this episode was produced by the Podwaves. Until next week, shalom. <laughs>